Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Peace and blessings to each and every one. My name is Saira Begumir and here we are at the Scouts Hut today uh, to celebrate the World Interfaith Harmony Week. We are truly grateful to um, King Abdullah II of Jordan for initiating the World Interfaith Harmony Week. I chose a theme for migration as I wanted to acknowledge and address the current situations, the issues we are all facing in this world. So one of the theme being migration, as there is so much talk about immigrants, how well, how some people don't want immigrants in their countries, and there are lots of people that are quite welcoming to immigrants. Um, so my story I want to share about how I came over to England. My father, um, sorry, I'm going to read off the script because I'm terrible uh, okay. off the cuff. My father came to England in 1968, almost a year before my dad sent for my mum and seven of her siblings a few years later. He came before, before to settle down. He wanted to get a job. He wanted to make sure he was earning money. He wanted to make sure that there was somewhere for us to live. So he came here quite a few, uh, a while before he called us over. quite difficult actually when you talk about it. the sacrifices that our parents, our grandparents have made and we don't realise how much they have to go through to get a better life for their children. The reason my father came over was because obviously where he was working and everything there was the, the conversations and discussions happening about what Idi Amin was going to do, he was going to expel all the Asian community out of uh, Uganda. So my father was obviously a bit wary to what was going to happen in a couple of years time to what he wanted to take action and he wanted to plan a safe place for his wife and children to go to. So I find it harder to talk obviously as you know, I lost both my parents quite recently, not long ago. And when my father came here, he got a job. I don't even know where he stayed, who he stayed with. He was like working really hard, uh, working days and nights, the sacrifices that he made to do all that. Um, not living in the comforts of his own home with his wife and children and his family around him. Um, lots like what a lot of people have gone through here. And and why did he come here? Because he wanted a better life for us. And we've been here since, oh, I'm not going to tell you how long we've been here, because I'm going to give my age away. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, England, we came to England. We first came to the, um, um, we moved in Lancashire. We came to Lancashire first. People, there's many people that are forced to leave their countries, not because they want to, they don't have a choice. Mm. And I thought this was a really important topic to talk about, mm -hmm. like I said, about what the current situation is about, what immigrants are, and maybe they're not good for the countries that they come to live in. But I think as all, I mean, we're all like-minded people in this hall. There's um, so many things that we do for each other, so we welcome uh, migrants. We know what we've been through, mm -hmm. and we know that we don't want other people to go through the same experiences. So we can, because we sort of, some of us are more established than others, it depends when you came here, that you can offer the support to others. We, we do try to integrate, but people we try to integrate and sometimes move away to a different place. But we try. Uh, I mean, when I came over as a, as a young child, uh, I was only a few years older than Penny when Penny came here. Um, you look at the weather, it's really cold in Uganda, it's really hot and you know, it's sunny. It was really cold here, you learn a new culture, a new language. And you try, everything you're trying to fit in your head at a small, at a young age. And, um, but I mean, like, we've, we've had lots of welcomes from so many people, and there were others. And then there are people that think, right, you can't, you can't be wearing that, or you can't be, you know, whether it's your gun and what they see people wear, or where they, the Bindi wear, the Hindus wear. And as we, as Muslims, some of us wear the hijab. But then people are like, why do you need to wear that? You can't be wearing that because we're not allowed to show who we are. But that's only some people, not everybody's like mm -hmm. that. And um, but I'm so glad that we have, um, we, we have a great network, that we respect each other, and that's what we need to build on. 
I'm of Jewish uh, extraction. My great great grandparents were migrants, but I didn't experience that. Yes, I've heard family stories. What many of you probably don't know about me is that I was actually an immigrant into another country where I spent 15 years. And when I went there, I didn't speak the language, but I was lucky because everybody spoke English. Learning the language was actually more difficult for me because everybody wanted to speak English. I was in Norway, the very north, and everybody said, oh, an Englishman, fantastic. But nonetheless, there were, there were struggles. I did overcome them. And I had a, an amazing uh, 15 years out there studying, uh, interacting with people. It was a very positive experience because I think the people around me were enlightened and they just wanted to be as welcoming and as inclusive as possible. I'm new here in the UK, so it's been just uh, five months now. So I came just recently, I'm from Afghanistan and I'm Muslim. So, uh, uh, about the religions, we do respect all the religions, it doesn't matter that as long as we are safe somewhere and we, we respect other religions. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I would just, uh, I don't have any grandparents who brought me here, so I'm, I'm the one uh, which I have brought my children here that maybe they have this story for their own after a while, maybe. So uh, yeah, uh, I can just I will tell the story like how how I make up my way to UK. So uh, actually, I don't wanted to come in here and never wanted to uh, because uh, everybody I know it's a, it's a good country. Nobody will know there's a different uh, religion in in London and UK. You can see different people from different countries, but still they will they will have some kind they respect each other. So. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm not having any complaint, like I don't want, it's not a good country, it is good, it's a good country, just uh, but if you're away from the family, from the relatives, so you will always, like I'm away from my mom and brothers, they're over there, so still I'm feeling alone here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, as I can say, like everybody here was so helpful with me. And it's a really good country. I enjoy it, as I said. So uh, still, uh, so uh, I was. Uh, so I'm just telling like how I got here. Uh, I, 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 in 2000 to uh, in 2008, I started uh, uh, learning English. So I learned English in a private course for uh, one year. Then after that, in the same time, I was just teaching other. Uh, children's English in the same course then uh, because I was a little bit good at English so that's why I start again the, in the same time I was teaching uh, other junior students so uh, after that uh, in 2009 I start working with the British Army as a translator in the southern provinces of Afghanistan which is uh, that was really a dangerous province that time I have uh, faced and I have seen a lot of uh, British Army soldiers being killed in front of me in a different... But I was lucky anyway, so I got saved from there. I've, uh, I've uh, worked in a really uh, dangerous uh, province for seven years, like four years with the British Army and then uh, three years with the US Army. So uh, as I say, like, I don't want to come and be in other countries. I rather stay in my own country with my own people. Well, again, I was the lucky one that I'm out of Afghanistan now, because the people just for you know selling their bodies part like they're selling their kidneys to survive from hunger, which is really frustrating. And uh, uh, so uh, my family is still there and uh, how I got and then uh, just in the last weeks before the government uh, of Afghanistan you know broke down uh, I received an email from the embassy of uh, British that uh, UK that they say is like you have worked with us you want to go to the UK so that was uh, every other people they apply for it but I didn't so I just received it somehow I was the lucky one I think and uh, uh, so I sent my uh, documents and I, s 
I thought that let's see what's come out, let's what's what with the answer for this email. So I, then I applied. I actually I sent my documents that I had the uh, recommendation letters from the different uh, units of army. But, uh, I I am the eligible to relocate to UK. Still, because uh, I was somehow I got fired from the British uh, Army, and they they told me you cannot work with the British Army anymore. So uh, I was uh, I was just wondering like how straight away they after two days they told me like you are eligible. Well, maybe I don't know. Maybe it's uh, it's my lack. Maybe again as as I said. So uh, that's how I am here, and uh, since I came here. I'm uh, working with the uh, different communities and uh, I'm attending the communities as you can see now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm uh, helping other Afghan families, which uh, most of them they don't know good English. Uh, my English is not really good, but uh, well, I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> you know a little bit. <laughs> and then, uh, still, I'm uh, helping uh, the Afghan families uh, in a different uh, ways when they're going to the because the, the, the tradition, the system in the UK is way different from Afghanistan. Mm. And those who are from Afghanistan in here, it's, it's really hard for them. It's a very hard time for them now. So still, uh, as I know a little bit of English and I can help them out with some points. So I'm doing that in a different ways. I'm try I, I just want to be useful for everybody. Yeah. So uh, that. That's why I was just I'm trying my best to you know have a good communication with the people with the at least to be I should pick up something from community from English people from any well from all over the world as I, as we can see people from different countries in here. Uh, so uh, I was saying like how I got here. So before uh, we were just outside the airport, Kabul airport, and you uh, everybody saw the crowd out, outside mm -hmm. in the news. So uh, uh, I tried to push through the crowd uh, to get inside the airport two days and two nights without having any food, anything at all, holding my two children in my arms, mm -hmm. and another one was with my, uh, my wife's uh, arm. So and uh, we pushed through. Uh, it was uh, just a distance of uh, maybe 300 meters, not too far. So we we spent uh, two days and two nights up to that. So 200, 300 meters, we just crossed it just in uh, two days and two nights, obviously. So uh, and uh, we have seen the Taliban they beating us to the stake. Actually, they beat me. Uh, uh, my son, uh, his hand was around my neck, so uh, they they suddenly hit him. So after I saw his uh, hand, it's, uh, it's become red, and I asked him, what happened, son? And he says uh, that, that, uh, that Taliban beat me up with this thing, and uh, was, I just cried that time. And then I say, because outside that uh, crowd, I refused to come to UK, because one of the, uh, my bosses, who I, I used to work with him, he was from Scotland. Uh, he's, uh, he is from Scotland, he's uh, Captain Robbie, and he helped me out to get here. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just, every, every time he called me, after I refused that I don't want to go to the, through that crowd, because it's a possibility of losing my children over there or anything happened there. So why should I, maybe the Taliban kill me after a month or a year or I don't know. But why should I go there and kill myself just straight away on the same day? So I, I just refused three times that I don't want to go to UK. But it's still that uh, Captain Roby, uh, a Scottish captain, he's, uh, he's, he's pushing me. He's telling me like, although I'm thinking about you and your family, you have to get to the soldiers, you know, the British soldiers, I don't know, somehow you have to. Then I just refused, like, as I said many times, and then uh, and the, for the last time he says, no, go there, I will show you a, a easy way where the British uh, soldiers are there and you can get into the airport very easy and quick. 
So I went there, actually he was lying to me. He was just trying to push me yeah, yeah, there to... When I got there and I saw there's a line or a queue, how do you say that? <laughs> yeah. there's, uh, and a queue there, uh, because it wasn't a queue, it was uh, just a crowd. Every was, uh, everyone was pushing to get inside the airport. Doesn't matter for them that they have a document or something that they can show to the you know, the US uh, soldiers or the British soldiers that they have worked with them. Or uh, just they was trying to push in. It doesn't matter like mm -hmm. what they have done. So uh, I was uh, just, you know, sitting there and he says like, uh, as he told me, like, I will get you this time through the very easy way. So I went there and there wasn't actually an easy way to get in. Wow. And uh, I saw there as a, a queue, which mm -hmm. the Taliban made a queue there and uh, everybody was standing, standing there. So the queue was just vanished after a few minutes. So it's just uh, somehow I got a stack there and in, the, in the crowd, and uh, and obviously I saw my hands, uh, son's uh, hand, and uh, that give me like I have to go, I have to yeah. push through yeah. that crowd to get out of Afghanistan mm -hmm. because they beat up my son and I couldn't do anything yeah. Yeah. to yeah. at least say something to them. If you say anything to them, they would have killed you. So uh, they never think about the female, children, mm. old, young, doesn't matter to them. Just as long as you say something against them, they will beat you or maybe they will kill you. So uh, that's uh, what, how I just came here and after, as I say, like two days or having got anything and I lost my backpack over there and the in the crowd August. and uh, when we got inside there was the Taliban and the British army there's another checkpoint kind of like they used to check the all the documents that they let you through inside the other other place where the, uh, the, the British army was there so uh, after they checking the all the documents and they, they let you uh, go through there so I spent another year another day over there and uh, without having water and food again. Mm. So we, we got some because the Taliban, when we asked them, like, uh, we want to buy food or water, they say, no, you're going with them. So just ask them to bring something for you. And if you see the British uh, soldiers over there, there was a lot of people again, they're waiting in the queue. And um, I actually, uh, while I was trying to buy some water, for the family and for myself, obviously, there's a, it was really hot weather there as well. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I, there were some kids that used to sell the water. So, when I saw that, if you, st if you want to stay in the queue, so you can't get water. If you go out of the queue, so obviously you will uh, start in the queue from beginning. beginning. So, I did this three times, just to get water. So, I started again the queue. So, at the midnight I made the way to inside that Boron Hotel where the British was. So, that was really hard time for us to get in. But I understand like it was for everybody, like their grandparents and, and I was also trying to, you know, get to here. It, was, it wasn't easy, mm -hmm. it was really hard. Yeah. But still, that was a good thing, but I had the opportunity to go to the USA as well, but I don't want it. I don't know why, but I like London. I, because I used to say this, like I don't want to go any other countries, but if anything happened, mm -hmm. or just if I had to, then I will go to the Canada or London. I don't know why, because I haven't been to other countries. Mm -hmm. So just, I was saying this, just like this. I don't know why, maybe I like the name or something. <laughs> I don't know. So uh, that's it, now I'm uh, here in London. And uh, and that's the good thing I like about the London is uh, they respect the, their, your tradition, your mm -hmm. your religion. They don't say any, why you wearing this burqa, job, or whatever you wear, just as long as you're not uh, doing anything with other people, you're just yourself and that's it. So uh, uh, that's how I hear and uh, recently I, uh, I don't want to take it too long, so just uh, so I, I got a job now uh, as an English teacher yes. in one of the school in here <laughs> and maybe I will start it uh, tomorrow, oh. I hope so. Uh, oh. And uh, I 
I'm a student of uh, uh, dentistry as well. As a, maybe I become a dentist. Maybe I'm not sure because maybe there's some other systems rules for that. I still I have uh, my documents from my university from Afghanistan, but I just send it for the translate uh, to just translate that transcript. So uh, after I will uh, apply to the university I hope I can get back to my course and complete it mm -hmm. and uh, again I want to be useful for the for this country now until I uh, as I as I said I I don't want to be a grandparent again as, as I said so uh, that's how I am here and uh, since I came here I'm uh, working with the uh, different communities and I'm uh, attending the communities as you can see now mm -hmm. uh, and uh, helping other Afghan families which uh, most of them they don't know good English. Uh, my English is not really good but uh, well I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> you know a little bit. <laughs> and um, uh, still I'm helping uh, the Afghan families uh, in a different uh, ways when they're going to the because the, the, the tradition, the system in the UK is way different from Afghanistan. Mm. And those who are from Afghanistan in here, it's, it's really hard for them. It's a very hard time for them now. So still, uh, as I know a little bit of English and I can help them out with some points. So I'm doing that in a different ways. I'm try I, I just want to be useful for everybody. Yeah. So uh, that. That's why I was just I'm trying my best to you know have a good communication with the people with the at least we I should pick up something from community from English people from any well from all over the world as uh, as we can see people from different countries in here so uh, uh, that's how I hear and uh, recently I uh, I don't want to take it too long so just. Uh, so I, I got a job now uh, as an English teacher yes. in one of the schools in here <laughs> and maybe I will start it uh, tomorrow, oh. I hope so. Oh. Uh, oh. And uh, I'm a student of uh, uh, dentistry as well, as a, maybe I become a dentist, maybe I'm not sure because maybe there are some other systems rules for that, I still I have uh, my documents from my university from Afghanistan, but I just send it for the translate, uh, to just translate that transcript. So uh, after I will uh, apply to the, the university, I hope I can get back to my course and complete it. And uh, again, I want to be useful for, the, for this country now. Until I, uh, as I, as I said, I, I don't want to be uh, grandparents that they, my grandchildren uh, say this is story like you guys are <laughs> telling us uh, because I want them to go back to my country but if the situations get better mm -hmm. and uh, we hope and uh, I will sometimes if the situations get better. So this is all about my story, mm -hmm. not too much but there's a lot of to, uh, things to say but as I can yeah. see like everybody wants to you know like we can see the times, so, <laughs> so yeah, Keep don't want going. to take it long. Yeah, that was it. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. I, I came today um, to share a story because I think the story is very relevant to today. Um, it is a story of my parents and in particular of my mother who had to emigrate several times in her life. Um, <clears throat> I am Jewish, I'm an atheist, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I am the first gener generation of Holocaust survivors. And I was born in what was called Czechoslovakia after the war, as the oldest child of, of my parents. Um, so the story really is about my mother, who uh, was born in what was then called Sudetenland. It was um, a part of uh, then Czechoslovakia, who, which was mainly, or to a large extent, occupied by German-speaking population. And when Hitler came to power, 
they all, <clears throat> or most of them, not all of them, have um, <clears throat> decided to affiliate themselves uh, with that growing German nationalism uh, that Hitler brought into Germany, and um, they have, um, <coughs> after, after Munich, uh, which I think you all know what that is, again, relevant to today, um, have uh, decided to um, expel all Jews out of Sudetenland. So my mother, who was then 14, with her family, had to pick up a suitcase and uh, move. They moved to Prague and lived in very cramped, but relatively comfortable con conditions. And when the Germans marched into uh, Czechoslovakia proper in 1939 and occupied uh, Czechoslovakia, the Jewish families were all um, <clears throat> um, moved by force into much more cramped uh, conditions from which they uh, were then taken into transport and into concentration camps. My parents were extremely lucky because there was a um, then Zionist organization which um, have, uh, as you said, uh, tried to populate Palestine by strong young Jewish people. And my parents managed to get a false Shanghai visa. My father, through um, his family, getting money together and pay for that visa. And my mother, through her family, paying for a very similar visa. Uh, they didn't know each other then, they were 10 years apart. My mother was 16 uh, when the Germans marched in and she was put into that um, um, group of people that were sent to Palestine uh, on a very difficult journey. Uh, so they, they were put on a train, they went to Bratislava, which was then a separate country. They were locked up in Bratislava in a kind of a detention center and then eventually allowed on a, a river pleasure boat along the Danube River down to Sulina, which is a, a port in Romania on the Black Sea. Uh, there was about 500 people on that boat then. It was a small river cruiser. Uh, by the time they got to Sulina, that boat had 2,000 people that were coming in from uh, Austria, Hungary, Romania, all Jews, all fleeing uh, the, uh, the Nazi regimes. Um, when they got to Sulina, they were transferred onto a Turkish uh, coal hull. It was a metal coal hull, um, and in that, uh, which had nothing. So they had to get their possessions together and they had to barter with uh, Romanian coast guards for wood and God knows what else and a group of strong people went and on that kohal they created platforms and on that platforms there were more and more people as they were doing all this, uh, they had to survive. They uh, had very little food and they got frozen in, in Sulina for a month. There was uh, no heating, no food. Anyway, um, in February the sea defrosted and they took off and they went through Dardanelli Bospor and they were then taken to outside Haifa. Uh, and in Haifa, the British had refused to allow them in. Uh, into Palestine because they were migrants coming from uh, the enemy occupied territory. Um, so they were, my father told me that they had to have 24 hour uh, guards um, on the board because uh, as they were outside port, there were rats invading the, the, the ship and they had to beat the rats back. Uh, because they would have attacked, they were dangerous, but it's just that I, I have loads of stories like that. But it's, um, it's again, it's a story that uh, very much relates to today. Both people coming and wanting an entry and not being allowed the entry. Eventually, 
after I think two weeks, weeks in the sea, they were allowed on, on into Palestine, and they were um, they were put into detention centers. My my father called them concentration camps. They were not examination camps, but they were camps with uh, surrounded by barbed wires and and machine gun towers, so they were a form of concentration camps. They were British detention centers. And my father was in his detention center for six months before he was allowed out. My, my mother was in a different detention center, and I don't know how long she was there. Eventually, they were allowed out, and they had to find a job. Um, and they were doing all sorts of jobs. My mother was a, a cleaner, and. I don't know what else, and my father was doing all sorts of different jobs. And eventually they both joined the British Army. And um, um, my mother was stationed in an ammunition depot in Cairo under the Citadel, and my father worked uh, for the British Army in, in England, uh, in, uh, sorry, in Palestine. And, um, um, they, they uh, spent the war in the British Army, and uh, in 1945 they were both demobbed, and they were again put into a detention centre, <laughs> because they have decided that um, they're not going to settle in Palestine. They, they were forced out of their own country, and they wanted to come home. Uh, so they had to wait until, for a year, they were in another detention centre for a year, again behind barbed wires and in a, in a camp which also housed um, fascists running away from Yugoslavia and Italy, Italy and you know it wasn't my father said there were fights there were um, it wasn't very easy and in 1946 the British have eventually put on a transport of Jews returning back to Europe and they came back to Czechoslovakia in 1946. Um, so so um, the, the going uh, f for my mother from the age of 14 or 15, um, for, for all those many years with all those changes, um, of course had a, uh, <laughs> had a particular toe. But I, I thought I'll tell you the story because it's, it's a story which so much resonates this today. Thank you. And I was born in London, but um, three quarters of my family were not. They came from abroad because they were Jewish. So I want to talk about my great grandmother. Um, so I just took, got some notes here. Her name was Henrietta Diamond. She was born Henrietta Beckman in Poznan, which is now Poland, but probably was under the rule of Germany at the time. Mm -hmm. And there was massive anti-Semitism out there. So they were really glad when Queen Victoria's first daughter, Vicky, um, married into the royal family expecting so she married Frederick. And Vicky really supported the Jews because she came from England where we were accepted quite well into society. And she attended two synagogues um, and said, you know, into the press, um, because uh, the Jews have been here a long time, there's no, no way that they are a negative influence in Germany. So um, anyway, so she, uh, she came to Britain probably trying to get away from the nasty atmosphere out there. And that was sensible, because if they'd stayed, they would have been killed in the Holocaust. Um, so she was born in 1875, and um, she came to Britain, and uh, in London she married um, Solomon Diamonds, um, who was uh, born in Ukraine, in Odessa, in 1873. And the family had enough money for him to come. His father, Jonas, had some sons, and they, they left because it was dreadful out there because of... Uh, the Tsar was not in good position, and so he was trying to make out that, um, I think, this one Tsar was assassinated, and one of the members of the people that assassinated him was a Jewish woman, 
And so that's why there's massive backlash against the Jews and there were enormous pogroms and there was also set up a pale of settlements which meant that they could only live within certain boundaries. It was like a massive ghetto, so they all trying to get out because lots of people were getting killed. So um, he got out and um, most, a lot of people tried to go to New York, America, <coughs> land of freedom obviously, but um, others came to London, Britain, they, they saw it as a place where your rights were set and respected. And um, so as I say, they married in London and then like they didn't, I, I don't quite know what drew each other, them to each other because, um, but I know that they were both singers, so <laughs> I like singing myself, but I don't have that, that degree. So um, Solomon, or Shlomo, probably called Shlomo, um, he was a cantor, so uh, he'd be in the synagogue, like it's not the same as ministers now, you just like, you have like, people who would just come and they'd use their pointer on the Torah and they'd just sing whatever, the words in Hebrew, but it all had to be sung. So they'd go, <laughs> and you'd read that, that'd be read through all that way, and then probably, I don't know if it was translated at that time. Anyway, but, um, so they say they got married, and very soon instantly went off to uh, live in Leeds because the Midlands, it's a good place to live for immigrants because you can get into industry and it's cheaper, isn't it, than London. You, you don't want to live in, in the slums of, uh, you don't want to live in the slums of uh, East London at that time particularly, do you? So, uh, so I went off to Leeds and um, my grandmother, a great grandmother, she had to get a job, obviously, because didn't have enough money and it's before starting a family. So she, the local factory were fi hiring um, hiring workers to make bras, so, uh, it's, but the advert said that you had to have experience. So, well, too desperate. So she just went along, she thought, right, I'll just, <laughs> I'll just do my bit. So they said, do you have experience? Uh, she wasn't, uh, she said, oh, yes, I do. Then she wasn't expecting the next thing is, which is, right, we're going to do a trial of you. You have to show that you do have experience. And she said, oh, I'm terribly sorry, I need to go to the loo. Have uh, you got a loo? So she went to the toilet, took her bra off, had a look at it, saw how her bra was put together, and then <laughs> when she went back and did the trial, she just managed to use a sewing machine to sew the bits wow. correctly. So they're happy and they accepted her for the job. And she worked at the factory for a while and then like she did, she did okay. And so she actually managed to set up her own uh, lingerie business and she had her own shop and then later they, they got a second shop. So, I mean, of the two of them, I think that she was a, she was a better, she did better in the world of work. And um, so, um, uh, but as I say, they, they were both singers. So she, uh, she had a lovely voice. I don't know if she had perfect pitch, but she had this little trick that she'd do. Um, sometimes they had parties together, uh, at parties and they, people would come along and, um, it's sort of a bit of a party piece. So she and her husband would sing some duets together or something. Then she'd get like a wine glass and she'd go ping or whatever. She'd get the note and she'd put it there and then she'd just sing that perfect note of it. And she could make it break, it just break because she could just hit the note precisely. So it was a bit, it's a bit of a silly thing, <laughs> but it looked, it looked good. But anyway, so she brought up, they had three children together the eldest one she called Siggy, um, Sigismund. Um, I think one reason for that was because uh, Vicky, first daughter of Queen Victoria, when she married Frederick, um, you know, who's going to be Emperor of Germany, um, she, um, she wanted to, have to pick German names for her kids, and so she called one of them Sigismund, and um, Siggy died at the age of, before he reached two, and I think people were really, really sorry for her. And she went back to, uh, to um, England for, uh, just uh, for the funeral, as uh, soon after the funeral, and Queen Victoria was just so, she just said, get on with your life, woman. You've lost a child, you've lost a son, but I've lost a husband, come on, it's much worse if you've lost a husband, get on with your work. And uh, I think people were sympathetic about that. Anyway, so I called her, called him um, uh, Siggy, and uh, I better not go on for too long, sorry. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, so as a manager of, these, uh, two, of this um, lingerie chain, she didn't really do that much, she stayed at home, um, because she had kids to bring up, 
and she got a bit bored. So she, um, at the time, there was a craze about um, contacting the dead in seances. So she, um, she, she used to have seances, but I, I think, you know, it's a bit silly, really. But what I really admire her for is the fact that she, she cared about her roots, that she cared about the value of human rights. So um, that both she and her husband had to escape from um, dreadful situations in which Jews did not have any human rights. They were, they were you know, about to be killed in a few years' time. So um, she, became, she set up the Leeds Lady Zionists Association and she became later the chairman of um, Zebulun. So Zebulun is an organisation, the Zebulun Seafarers Association, and they were trying to train um, Jews who had emigrated to Palestine to, in, in how to run ships, how to be mariners, sailors. Uh, the object being because um, Palestine was a British protectorate at the time, and um, there, I think there were certain lands that, that Jews weren't meant to have access to. Anyway, there was difficulty getting, getting supplies and people into um, Israel. Um, Israel hadn't been set up a state yet. And so, um, before, in 1939, just before the war, they were trying to get the kids out, the Jewish kids out of Germany so that they wouldn't be slaughtered. And they were, on, they were put on board ships and things, they, and the ships were kind of stopped and not allowed to get into uh, Israel, into Palestine. And uh, there was a lot of... So, I mean, people like these uh, sailors of the Zebulun Association, they helped um, because they torpedoed some of the German boats who were trying to uh, stop these kinds of operations. So I'm very proud of her for that, but not for the seances. <laughs> and uh, she actually got separated from her husband later. I guess they didn't kind of hit it off for too long. And uh, I think, although she went on she, till the age of about 83 is when she died. Um, and uh, so that's the person and, that I'm thinking of. I was born in the UK, um, here in, in, near in Waltham Forest, actually Hackney. Uh, raised in Waltham Forest, but my, um, I was also a migrant to another country. I spent 10 years in the United States when I married my husband. And um, so I felt being a migrant, and I had a very positive, like Paul, very positive experience in the United States. Was very well received as a migrant, but my story today to talk about is the, the migration story of some of my community who have come here my mother came here 51 years ago to serve in the NHS as a Filipino migrant, um, trainee nurse actually, and she, she had a lot of struggles coming here, but she, it was a positive story for her because she came to this country um, in open arms because the country welcomed her and needed her, as opposed to some of my other community members who have been living in this country some 10, 15, 20 years, undocumented, never having regularized their status, their immigration status. And their story is not one of welcome. Um, in fact, their story is one of the narrative that we're, we're often hearing about, you know, send those migrants home. Um, and these are people that, as I said, 10, 15, 20 years, half their adult life has been living and, 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 work, uh, and caring in the, and living and working and caring in this country. Um, they are caregivers, so a lot of their stories are that they are 24-hour live-in carers for people that have got dementia, they are nannies, so they take care of our children. Um, and these are migrants that just, you know, they, they'd love to be able to settle their status. They'd love to be able to, 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 to change that. And um, they haven't been able to do that so far. So that, that I'm carrying their story here today because it's just something that's weighing on my heart, has been on my heart for a long, long time. And that's the reason why I think, I think I've been called to talk about it today. <laughs> but um, yeah. And my story is rather different, but um, it's, it's not the usual sort of migrant story, but my parents were very much affected by the Second World War, the sort of things that, um, that best described in hers, but very differently. I'm from this country, I was born in Sussex, I'm very privileged, I talk like the BBC, and I went to a grammar school, and I had two parents and lived in the same house 
all of my growing up, and my dad died in the same house a long time later. But my mother came from Scotland, and she lived in a little sleepy seaside town on the west coast of Scotland. And her dad was very firm and a bit of a patriarch, very loving but very strict. And she worked for the, she left school about 15, worked for the local newspaper office in the office and really wanted a bit more in her life, I think. And she was 17 when the Second World War broke out. Mm -hmm. So that was her chance mm -hmm. to get away from home and see a bit of life. So she joined the ATS. And her dad was shocked and didn't know what to say, but he couldn't stop her because she was doing it for her country. How could he argue with what she was doing? Can you say what that stands for, ATS? Oh, this, the ATS is the Auxiliary Ter Territorial Service, which was part of the army where women served. Um, thank you, Bess. Uh, so her work was largely on, um, on gun sites and um, anti-aircraft. The women weren't allowed to fire at the aircraft, but they could work the machines that predicted enemy aircraft coming over. And they worked alongside, um, alongside men in the army, so it was, it was an interesting life. Um, but my, I think my grandfather was um, very worried that she would be mixing, she'd be going to that England and even that London and mixing with other people and she'd be meeting men and all sorts. But she managed to convince him it was all right. And um, my father was taken prisoner in North Africa and he was in prison camps and uh, for, for a couple of years and, and he wasn't liberated until the end of the war in 1945. And when they came home, these prisoners, they were the, the army thought they'd better look after them because of the trauma that they'd suffered, uh, which my, my dad was very dismissive about, actually. Um, and they were in a, an army camp um, in, uh, in, in the west, west country of England, near where my, my dad lived. My dad was from Bournemouth. And on this camp, the staff that looked after them were ladies of the ATS. Because the army, in its wisdom, thought all of these men prisoners, they haven't seen a woman for many years and they need to, to meet some fine, un, upstanding, um, decent women like we have in the army. So the staff in this camp were, were, were all ATS people. And, uh, and that's where my mother met my father and they fell in love and, um, and the rest is history. But she had, she had left her home and it was very different although you could say there wasn't a language difference because in Scotland they do speak the same language as we do but they speak it very differently and uh, my, my mother didn't have a very strong Scottish accent but it must have been at first and I can even remember in childhood my mother telling me one time when I was running out to play and she said to me very firmly now you remember no playing with chalk. And I racked my brain and I couldn't remember stealing any chocolate or anything. I didn't know what I'd done. And then I remembered that I had been writing on the pavement with chalk, which is what we called it. And I, I do remember that there, there were things that I, I didn't understand about the way my mother spoke. But my mother was a great actress and she got into amateur drama. So she decided to lose her accent as quickly as possible so that she wasn't um, typecast, so she could take on any, any role in a play. Her brother, my uncle, he was a salesman. And it was his job to be very charming and persuade people into things. <coughs> so he was very careful to keep his Scottish accent because people do spend money with people who have Scottish accents because they're very charming and attractive. So it was interesting when my uncle came to, to visit, although he lived in England, he had this strong Scottish accent, which my mother had completely lost. Um, but we had a, a firm sense that, that we, we had a connection with Scotland. She didn't go there very much. Um, there was one time I went there with her when um, my, my grandfather was ill and I was only about five years old. And I, I have very little memory of it, but 
My, my father stayed at home to look after my two brothers, who were a bit older than me, and, and my mother and I went to Scotland for a few days. And while we were there, my father sent me a letter, a typed letter. It was a beautiful I, I keep it forever, and um, it just says, uh, it, it has a story in it. It says, once upon a time, there was a little girl called Sally, and she went on a long journey, and her daddy did this and that and everything. It's, it's the loveliest story. Um, and in this box, I have got a big collection of letters. Well, my mother kept all these letters. Um, so uh, they were in this camp for a time, and then uh, they, they were demobbed out of the army eventually. My dad tried to stay on as long as he could in the camp because he was safe. It's like those people who don't want to leave prison. <laughs> he was very lazy, my dad. Um, and my mother was back at, at Scot in Scotland sometimes. My dad was in Bournemouth, and they were separated. And all of these letters talk very much about how it, these are all in 1946. Oh. And um, the house was very crowded. My dad's mum was widowed very early and left with three children to look after and no money from her husband's family um, because they, they didn't like her very much. And she, she used to let rooms in a, a, a house. In, she had a big house in Bournemouth is all she had. So she let rooms. And there were always extra people in the house. Mm -hmm. And even after my, my dad went back from the army, he was living at his mother's. And lots of these letters say, when you come at the weekend, my darling, um, I don't know which room you'll be in. Maybe you'll be across the road with what's her name, but we'll find somewhere for you to be, don't worry. But you just feel between the lines the pressure on people to find somewhere to be because everything was so crowded and so ad hoc and trying to build a life after this terrible traumatic war that they'd all been through. I can't imagine what it must have been like for them. But I think the strongest thing I feel about my mother's values was that she made her commitment. She had come to here from there. She was proud of her heritage, but um, she, she didn't make a fuss about it. And she was content with what she had. And she, she was a very strong um, personality and, um, and very loving. And, and she and my dad loved each other to the end. And it was wonderful. And um, but the end came too soon for her, and um, we used to we used to celebrate we used to celebrate New Year with a big big party every year. There would always be people in our house, and um, I think it was important to her to to make her new home and commit to that. And um, although she would she would say nice things to us. And if England were playing Scotland at football, well, there was no, no problem which side she was on. Yeah, that, was, that was fine. And, um, yeah. And, and she always, if she comes here at New Year, she would tell you how to sing Old Lang Syne with the proper words. Yeah. <laughs> everyone in our family and everyone who ever met my mum knows the proper words to Old Lang Syne. <laughs> which means peace and blessings to you all today. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Saira, for this invitation. And when I think about migration, I think about my mum and dad, because um, I was born in Pakistan, and actually 20 days before I was born, my father came to this country, and I spent the first four years in Pakistan living with my mum and her, her parents, uh, my grandparents. And I'll, I don't remember it, but my, I've got lots of stories of how I was spoilt when I was um, little because there's a poor little girl, she hasn't got her mummy and daddy and uh, <laughs> my aunties were there and my mum and my grandparents really looked after me. Um, one of my aunts, when I was about one, I was quite a big fat chubby baby and in Pakistan they think if you're chubby and fat, that's, that's health. 
um, and she took me to um, a baby competition and I won first prize. And, uh, she came home with this great big rocking chair and she hadn't even told my mum, so at that point she had to tell my mum that she'd entered me for this um, competition. And my mum said, well, it's a good job they didn't look at, uh, in your hair because you had like scabs or something. And she said, but you looked really fat and chubby. <laughs> so. Um, my grandfather, both my grandparents um, were train drivers, which in Pakistan, India at that time was a really prestigious job because they travelled lots of places and were considered very highly. And my, my mum's father really liked cleansiness, you know, he didn't like anything dirty and he had his special bed. And there was one fan above his bed um, in the house and it was above his bed and nobody was allowed to sit on his bed. And my mum said, you used to lie there on his bed under the fan and nobody would tell you off because my, my grandfather would say, poor little girl, you know. She <laughs> um, so she said I was spot rotten by him. Um, when I was four, I came to this country. My very earliest recollection is of lots of bright lights. So I don't know whether that's Heathrow Airport when we first arrived, but... I don't know where it's from, but it's really, really bright lights. So at the age of four, I first met my dad. And to me, he was a stranger. And I had um, a brother two years older than me, a sister two years older than him, and another brother two years older than them. And they all remembered dad, so they made the connection. But for a long, long time, I never had that connection with my dad because my dad, he worked really hard. He worked night shifts and he was studying and um, sleeping during the day. <clears throat> and my mum and dad actually sacrificed every single thing that I had to come to this country for their four children. Um, they left their family, their friends, and they were committed to making a better future for their four children and a better life that they would have, but they wanted that for, for their children. Um, magically, a year later after we arrived, my little sister turned up and my mum always says, that's, that's Britain's present to her, so I've got a little baby <laughs> sister. Um, but the four older ones, the focus for us as we were growing up was always study hard, work hard, um, make the best of the education you've got. And the four older ones, we all went to university and all got really good degrees and all went on to become professional people. Um, and all that hard work, I think, um, anything that I've gained, or my brothers and sisters have gained, actually even my, my children, my grandchildren, anything that they gain, I think, has stemmed from the hard work that my parents put in in the first place, because they gave up their friends and family and they came to this country. Um, my father worked really hard. My mum made the decision, a lot of my mum's friends went to work so that they could earn as much money but my mum made the decision that I'm not going to work because my children are my priority and mum um, was always at home and when we came home from school there was always um, food on the table and at five o'clock we had to go off and study and um, um, my mum didn't know what we were doing but she'd make sure that we had the space and time in order to do that and Listening to your stories, it was lovely hearing the connections, and there are little connections I was uh, making that um, actually it's gone out of my mind, but it'll come to me while I'm talking. But you know, the sacrifices that my parents made, for example, um, <clears throat> because my parents didn't have very much money, and what money my father earned, he spent, um, sent a lot of it back to his parents in Pakistan, mm -hmm. and he sent money for his sister and family and people to get married and supported them and then his parents came and um, uh, I remember my, my grandparents living with us and um, again my, we had a house and we were all squashed in one room because we had tenants in our house so it's always different people coming in and out of the, the house and it might sound really strange now, but you know the old telephones, there was one telephone in the house, and quite often, you know, it might be the, the tenant, so the ten telephone was in the passage, we used to have a lock on the telephone, so that we could get calls coming in, but people couldn't, you know, yeah, now that, know. that sounds really strange. Um, but do you know what, um, a little while ago, for a project that I was doing, um, it had talked to 
what are your memories of your childhood? So I was talking to my four brothers and sisters about memories of their childhood. And everything that we talked about was summarised in, we didn't have very much, but we were happy. <laughs> and all my um, mum and dad's friends, a lot of them, like men who came from Pakistan, would stay and live with my mum and dad. Mm -hmm. And they'd, um, at that time, people didn't have money, but there was a lot of love and support for one another. And so the single men that came and stayed in our house, every one of them, when they left, they put money together and each one put a deposit on the house, mm -hmm. apart from one, and that one we saw years later. And I said to my mum and dad, I know you said to put a deposit on the house and settle, and we never did, and we regret that to this day. But you know those connections that you make at that time when you help others, mm -hmm. they're there forever. And you know, when my father passed away seven years ago now, um, he left a big hole, and at the beginning of COVID, unfortunately, my mum passed away. And now it feels that that umbrella that my parents had um, has gone, and now me and my brother, we're the old generation. It's still taking time to sort of adjust to that. But in terms of migration and coming to this country, the struggles that they went through, you know, that was a time when there were skinheads who said, Packies out, and there were signs on the doors that said no blacks, no Irish, no dogs, um, you know, and those sorts of things. And you know, you think we've lived through that, um, and there was out and out racism at that point. Now, I don't know, there's still racism, I'm sure, but it's sort of hidden away, so it's harder to see. And in terms of what you were saying about Jewish and Muslim people, um, I'll, I'll, I've been into an organisation, I don't know if you've heard of it, Nissan Shim, so it's Jewish and Muslim women coming together. So a Jewish and Muslim women got together and talked about how we can move forward in a positive way and the issues that Jewish women face are almost exactly the same, but different, uh, but Muslim women face, so they've got together and um, they've got like 25 subgroups. So I'm co-chair of the Nissan Shim teacher subgroup. So you know, Jewish and Muslim teachers talking together, other people are lawyers or you know, different either professions or locally like regions like North London, Miss Anshin women. But it's so lovely just to get together with women and you know, try and be positive and look forward positively to the future. And also I was thinking of the East End of London, the history of the East End was like the, I think it was a French community, then there was a Jewish community, and then as we were growing up, a big Bangladeshi community. And you know, life changes and things evolve over time, and the, and the patterns are there. I went to the business and machine group, we had our last meeting in East End, and we went to um, um, a synagogue in East End, and you know, and they were talking about the history. Then we went to a mosque, and the mosque had been a church. So, you know, when you talk about religion, actually when you talk about all religions, the basis of all religions is the same, about mm -hmm. peace and, you know, moving forward together in a positive way. So, um, just rounding off, really, I think the values that my parents taught was to work hard, respect everyone, and, you know, try and, whatever you do, try and do positive things. So that, you know, like my mum and dad aren't here, but they've left a big legacy mm. for the world, for the future. Um, and one last little story about my dad. He used to take my children and my brother and sister's children to nursery and back every day. And he was obviously a brown uh, Pakistani man. And they, the nursery teachers really liked him, and he used to go there every day. And they asked him to be Father Christmas, so he used to dress up as Father Christmas. I've got a beautiful picture of my dad as Father Christmas. So all these white children are probably thinking, why is this Father Christmas black? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's the multicultural world that we live in, and I've taught for 30 years in Northern Forest mainly. And I think, you know, the multicultural nature of Waltham Forest and what Waltham Forest stands for um, is just... You know, in my school, I felt it was a huge strength to have children from different um, places to celebrate. I used to um, do an iftar to invite Muslim children and white children and black children and all children to celebrate with me about Islam and Eid and iftar. 
but also to celebrate Hanukkah, to celebrate Diwali. You know, what a rich, beautiful thing it is to, you know, and a privilege to be able to celebrate so much. And I think Waltham Forest in general, I've lived in Waltham Forest since the age of four, and I just think it, it's the best place in the world to be, and I think London is an amazing, multicultural, cosmopolitan city, and how privileged I am to be a small part of that. Thank you. Okay, ready. Say your name. Hi, I'm Penny. <laughs> my mom is Wendy and my dad is Mark. So, um, if I have to talk about migration and things like that, I'd probably think about, well, school a little bit. Like, aside from being scared of the big um, test that I fear the most in this world, um, SATs, um, aside from thinking about that as a part of school, I think of migration a little bit because of um, my mom actually came and met my dad through school and same did my, um, all my grandparents. So yeah, that, whenever I think of school, I kind of think about migration a little bit. And there's something I also had to add on to um, stuff about migration and like how things are new. I am still trying to get through um, learning a little bit more like of like the English way of pronouncing things um, because yeah I was I was raised over here since like three th three <laughs> since three so I still have my American accent and I switch between English and American sometimes and um, it's at school I use my British accent my British accent the only reason why is because my friends have this weird thing where they like to imitate me and it gets really annoying so then I just switch <laughs> to either a really bad English accent to mimic them or just a normal English accent. So when I'm around my family I'm more in, like I speak with my American accent more of, yeah. <laughs> uh, so when I know, when I um, came over here, like my first memory probably of coming over here is coming to this house that my cousins lived in uh, because that's where I lived temporarily. Um, if I had to, th my first memories are probably of me and my cousins playing with my iPad that eventually got broken. Oh. <laughs> um, but that's one of my clear memories and those cousins actually still live next to me today and are always going to stay there, <laughs> hopefully. Because I, I don't like moving away from people that I love. But what I've realized is that to thrive in life, you need to let go of the things that you love most sometimes. So, yeah. I think that's all I have to say now. Um, so, I guess... My migrant story will, can stretch all the way back to my grandparents. So, uh, you know, after World War II, um, well, my grandparents are from the Philippines. After World War II, uh, you know, the place, pretty much the islands were bombed and everything was, uh, when, you know, after getting rid of the uh, Japanese military, uh, the U.S. bombed the whole area to make sure that the uh, uh, the Japanese were driven out, but at the same time, economically, it really destroyed the country. And so, since then, uh, the only people who have had much power are uh, corrupt government officials and the rich families who were already rich to begin with. And so, like, families like mine, uh, who were poor farmers, had to find ways to, um, to, make, uh, to make it up the economic ladder, socio-economic ladder, so that they can um, support their families, because in those days they would have many, many kids. So my, uh, my grandmother, um, from my mom's side, allowed my mother to go to school, and she became a nurse. So there wasn't many options, actually, to pull yourself up, other than being educated, usually as a nurse. Um, and or the military so you would join the military and the US military was an option so my father ended up joining the US military and my mother became a nurse and if you look around hospitals 
uh, or in different countries all around the world, you'll see a lot of the nurses happen to be Filipino. Yeah. And we're like, a, Philippines is almost like a factory for nurses. And, and uh, we're all over the world, you know, Canada, United States, UK. And so that's, that's part of the reason why. I, I don't really, I'm sure there's more to it. But one of the ways to, to be able to help your family was to get out of the country and uh, make money someplace else and then bring it back in. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, in terms of how the government took loans uh, from big banks, right? Anyhow, uh, my parents, uh, it, my mother first immigrated to Canada as a nurse. And um, her, I guess, I don't know how to describe it, but uh, you know, it's nice that you brought letters of your family because my, my parents have these like, you know, court, court, they call it courting. So they would, date by first starting to send letters. And they knew each other because they, they were in the neighboring towns. And my dad was, my, uh, was the best friend of my mom's brother. But he passed away. But after he passed away, uh, he decided he'd want to reach out to my mother. Still have the connections. Yeah, yeah, still have those kind of connections. And so he reached out to my mom in Canada while he was touring around in, in the military and sending letters back and forth. And then they decided to get married somehow. So, like, <laughs> so they got married in Canada, and uh, this was during the Vietnam War. So my, my dad was stationed in different areas, but somehow um, uh, his ship was bombed in uh, uh, near Egypt. It was like this big conspiracy. It's called the Liberty. You might want to Google that sometime if you want to uh, learn about that ship. But anyways, most of the people who who uh, survived the bombing of that ship, um, they were able to d decide where they wanted to be stationed. So my dad decided to be stationed in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. And so my dad took my mom over there. And um, from, from, they were lucky because they were able to get social housing, uh, military social housing. And uh, they were able to raise up uh, my brother and I. So there was only two of us. And so we were mainly raised up over there, and it's, it, you know, growing up, I always wondered, I always wondered, like, man, how did my parents make it when they had, like, nothing? They came from nothing, you know? Although living the farmer's life isn't nothing, but they had no money. <laughs> so it was, it, was, uh, it was pretty interesting, like, I, I was asking questions, and sometimes the universe answers weird questions, like, you know, like when, you, when you wonder why, uh, well, how were you able to do what you did to move away from your family and friends and stuff like that? Like what you had to as, do. as I said, like I'm uh, connected with the, all the stories now. Yeah, so it's really powerful. Okay. Thank you. For, that that okay. was really powerful to share. And you know, my my parents' story of like moving away obviously isn't it's not isolated. You know, my 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 wife's family did the same thing, and. Uh, you know, when I listen to their story, my, my wife's mom is also a nurse, so she came here to be, edu to, to be educated as a nurse as well, uh, to continue her education so she can work in the NHS. But my father-in-law was actually a lawyer in the Philippines. He just graduated, passed the bar, and because Wendy was born, he had to come to England to take care of the baby. But when he was here, he wasn't allowed to be a lawyer. So he started from she started from the ground up. He became a janitor. So, like, uh, then he became a pizza manager. And then somehow, God made it that he met the right people and he was able to start his own business. So, you know, God works in mysterious ways. And, and I, I feel the same for my family because uh, my, originally, my, you know, after the war, my, my grandmother um, didn't want her kids to be separated from the family. But my, uh, the, her, her, her dad had just died in the mines. Um, he was run over by accident. And so uh, my grandfather's brother wanted to help uh, my, mom's, my mom's family. So um, he brought uh, my mom, or asked, he asked my grandmother if my mom could go to school. And my grandmother at first didn't want to do it because she didn't want her to leave. Um, but because of those decisions, 
Um, she was able to, like I said, go through that whole journey to go to Canada, uh, court with my father, and then come to the United States. And that from there, they are able to make a decent life, a decent living. And um, my brother and I were able to uh, get educated. And um, when I met my wife, what ended up happening for me is that <laughs> uh, she moved over to, see, to be with me for 10 years. And then when there was an opportunity here in, in the UK, uh, when my, my mother-in-law wanted to go back living in the Philippines again, um, uh, my wife said, hey, let's go back to the UK. And now I'm a migrant here. So, <laughs> so, so I was uh, mentioning like, you know, God works in mysterious ways. You gotta watch out what you ask for, especially if you ask questions. Because my question was like, how did my, how did my parents um, how were they able to do what they did, moving away from family? You know, we're lucky because we do have uh, a family business to help us. So it's, it's more like what you said, the missing of family, the relationships that you leave behind. <clears throat> and uh, I found it quite challenging. And even though I speak English, it's American English, it's still different culturally, right? It's still different culturally over here. There are so many things that are different, yet kind of the same. Yeah, you have to translate it, right? You almost have to translate it. So there are words like lift, but we call it elevator. Elevator. You know, line, the line. Yeah, get in the line, but they mean get in the queue. Yeah, right. So, so there's all these things that you kind of have to learn. And, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to learn football, football, football. And so, anyhow, the. Uh, the, the thing that I'm taking from listening to everybody's stories and, and, um, and thinking of reflecting on my grandparents' stories, because uh, the one thing that my parents were able to do was to be able to bring money back home to help support the family back home, and at the same time, give them opportunity, if they wished, to come and live with them. And that took years and years. So I lived in the family. In our house, we had about uh, three and a half families. <laughs> so we had people living downstairs, upstairs in rooms. I, I was never alone in my room. I was with all my cousins and we all stayed in one little house. And uh, so there was a bunch of families. But then somehow uh, God was good and um, allowed them, e even though they all had to start from the ground up, uh, they were able to uh, uh, find their way as well and, and build their families. And they're all doing decently well. And uh, I, mean, I mean, they have a house, you know, I'm not saying they're rich or anything like that, but they're, they're making a living and they have their families as well. And so, you know, I always give that up to God and, and i just thankful to God for, uh, but, you know, letting things happen in the way that they did. You know, I know that everybody has a struggle, but I think if you stay God-centered, uh, whatever your religion or faith is, um, or just stay centered in terms of Buddhism, you know, and you have the right reference point. Uh, I think that you could, uh, you know, you, you could survive. You could not only survive, but what I've learned from my, my in-laws and my parents uh, and their families is that you can thrive. So, and I think that's the key thing, wherever you're at, that you have to figure out a way to get beyond survival and figure out a way to thrive, you know, whether it be education, like what you're doing, or, and finding purpose. Because yeah. I think that's beautiful what, you, what you've done is you've been able to find purpose even though you've had to be away from your family. And I think I'm doing that for myself as well. Uh, even though I'm away from my family, um, finding purpose in life is, is key. Of course, I've had my kids here. Hi. You know, so that's, that's, a, that's a huge thing. That's a huge thing. It's always having my kids around. And, I have child you know. number one. Yeah, she's a child number one. <laughs> Anyways, I, I, like him, I could probably go on and on in terms of uh, family stories. But I, 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 I like this forum because I feel like everybody needs to um, delve into their family stories. And um, we, we went to a cultural conference uh, in the, uh, for, for folks from the Philippines. And uh, particularly in the north, in, in the mountain areas, where we're considered the indigenous folks. And this conference was really important because one of the things that uh, we re recognize is that the history of our people in the country itself, in the home country, 
is important, but what is equally important are the ties outside of it, so the diaspora. The history of the diaspora is important, and, and the efforts that our ancestors have made, even though we're apart, are key to how we were able to thrive. So if we can all record those stories, I just think there's just so much value in it. Hearing everybody's story, so I just say thank you. Thank you. And I don't have the same dramatic migration story that everyone else has. Um, but I, I guess you could say I come from a blended family of Northern Irish and Southern Irish, which is um, challenging in itself. But I moved over from Northern Ireland, I grew up in Northern Ireland. I moved over to Wales to go to sixth form college and I went to the Midlands to go to university and down to London. And you do notice the differences there are in the way you express yourself, the things that are important. I think that's common, um, regardless of how uh, short your migration might be. Um, and we notionally had a common language, but I know that I speak to my husband sometimes and he just looks at me in a sort of, you think I know what you just said, don't you? <laughs> I have no idea. And that's when I realized the differences. Um, but thinking from the perspective of World Interfaith uh, Harmony Week, and I'm a Nichiren Buddhist, and I was thinking about migration, and I don't think we even talk about it in Nichiren Buddhism. We are just solely focused on the respect for the dignity of all life. So it really doesn't matter, and we think that the differences make the world a richer place. Um, my other hat coming here today is that I helped to run the Waltham Forest Migrant Action um, Migrant Support Centre in Walthamstow, which is set up primarily, um, not primarily, solely for migrants coming to this country who need help with integration, who need help to negotiate the difficult systems that we have put in place um, for everything from housing through to food etc. Sarah will probably say more about the, the need for food support. Um, but that was all I really wanted to share. That um, I have a I have a banner over in the corner um, which says everything you need to know. Migrants welcome here. And I think the world would be a poorer place if we didn't get out and meet each other and get to know each other. I have some little business cards over there if anyone wants to take them for someone that they know that might need support um, who's come to this country and feel, feels they have nothing. And that's all I wanted to say, but thank you for holding this event. It's been really humbling to hear all these different stories. And it just goes to show that we all have migration somewhere in our own stories. So I just I just want to thank everybody here. Thank you very much. Um, it's, been lot, it's been amazing listening to your stories. Uh, some have been really um, you can't really imagine what your parents or your grandparents have gone through. It's been really difficult and some have had it well not easy but it's been difficult. But our journeys have always they're not similar, they're very different journeys because we all experience different things. But the thing is, the, the point is, it's been the same to migrate and why we had to migrate and why do we migrate? Because we want a better life for ourselves and our children.